Hello everyone, Em and Jess here for One Thing Needed and welcome to another video. We have received an open letter to Mike Bickle from Susan Claridge, Tammy Wood's sister, also known as the second Jane Doe. Beyond the new allegations, it's intriguing to note that Mike Bickle may not have maintained the silence he claimed was divinely advised. This situation goes beyond his previous statements in the failed video shoot. She's now telling us she's found his fake online profile and website and has revelations to share about his sexuality. His notes were usually more polished than what we are seeing and this website but then again, his leaked emails were not very well put together, but he was deeply fatigued, he stated. Plus, he had an editor for his sermon notes, which essentially were the core of his legitimacy, even with many theologians. But Susan, in this letter, is gonna go through Mike's online profile and site and pick apart what sounds like him and his telltale trademarks and flourishes. Also share her experience with his character through the years, which we are sharing here today because many victims of his former cult are finding that it's healing to get in touch with the reality of who this man was um, uh, and break out of the shared delusion, <laughs> which coincidentally, you will hear her in the letter break and give a reality check to Mike himself several times in fact. Interestingly, this time it's not just involving his cousins and son's friends, but there's speculation about whether Anne, his assistant or former assistant, could be helping him and setting him up with a website. Now, it's important to emphasize that these are all allegations. Everything discussed on this channel is presented as an allegation, as we consistently mention. Susan here is going to make allegations regarding Mike's sexuality, and it seems she's using this claim as a strategy to prompt Mike to come out of hiding and address the situation publicly. She, indeed, like most of us, is quite angry and it shows. It's essential to recognize that an individual's sexuality is their personal matter, to disclose when and if they choose, and privately to whom they choose. And we are not endorsing this methodology and do not think she means it sincerely. Nonetheless, outing someone's sexuality as a form of insult or without their consent is not appropriate and cannot be endorsed. Mike is already facing other potential legal issues and our aim in reporting this is to provide context that might be overlooked elsewhere. Uh, as seen with the Misty article, Misinformation can spread widely and shape perceptions due to the phenomenon where initial impressions often form lasting beliefs. Research supports this. Um, given Mike's history of physicality and the use of mock wrestling and domination tactics with both males and females, these allegations take on a new dimension. Therefore, uh, just as we've advocated for individuals like Jane Doe to seek support from Julie, receive therapy, and find safety and anonymity with our help, we extend the same call to action for any potential. Before we start with the letter, please, if you would, like, subscribe, and share. There are many resources we plan to compile, and all of this helps as we, the co-victims, strive to maintain our faith and deprogram from IHOP. Susan's letter to Mike starts as follows. As is consistent with your narcissistic impulses, you have left clues to your true identity, not just the human identity of Mike Bickle, but that of the false prophet, the liar, the manipulator, the deceiver, the everything that is anti-Christ. Oh, the madness that must be gripping your mind as you have spent your entire life seeking to know the timing of Christ's return, to be elevated and idolized by God's people. But you do not ride in God's chariot. You do not stand before God's throne. You have built a rickety platform of falsehood, and God has removed his people from that platform so they can watch as your own structure of lies crushes you. Let's look at what you wrote in today's ex post on the account of Larry Wiseman. You use this phrase, piercing prophetic word, and piercing prophecy. Do you know how many times you have used that terminology in your sermons? It's a bickleism. I would advise you to learn your own isms before you try to pose as someone else. You wrote, the Lord is prophetically correcting Dr. Brown and we will share that prophecy after we give you the backstory. Since when does God Almighty focus on the backstory? The backstory is a human need to explain or justify actions. In addition, if God is speaking, who is we? Shouldn't it be I? You wrote, Tammy Wood says they did not have intercourse, however. We don't know if her allegations are true because we have not heard both sides of the story. Reality check. You, Mike Bickle, lived the story. You already know both sides. 
You know you did not have intercourse with Tammy, nor Jane Doe, nor H, nor AR, nor CS, nor ME, or any of the long list of women with whom you have been involved. You refrained from intercourse because that was not your reason for involvement with these women and children. The homosexual inclinations that have overwhelmed you your entire life manifest in a longing for female intimacy, romance, friendship, and connection. These relationships are your song of songs. For that intimate bonding, you nurture a relationship. You build trust. You kiss tenderly, hug closely, fondle gently, and allow climax. But when that release is complete, you are riddled with regret and remorse. The anguish you feel in that moment you mask as repentance and pray for forgiveness. But your prayer is not for forgiveness of those actions. It is for forgiveness of your true desire, the one you cannot face, the one that frightens you more than anything, your homosexual nature. The other side of all of these stories is that you, Mike Bickle, are a closeted narcissistic homosexual. That is not a prophetic word. That is my opinion based on my outside observation. And to that, I invite psychologists and psychiatrists from all outlets not linked to the church, IHOP KC, or to Mike Bickle and his minions to engage in an analysis of this man and share their professional opinions. Wow, so I'm just gonna jump in here. So Susan here is making allegations about Mike being homosexual and what she may not know is that narcissists, the true ones that meet the DSM criteria, the ones that have a fake persona, double lives manipulation and emotionally hack their target's attachment system to get a supply of attention and compliments are often bisexual. They prey on beauty and weakness and the things they feel has value and they drain the person of identity and make it a zombie. This is how Misty and Diane allegedly would be able to parrot these talking points. The problem is the world and the devil has made narcissist mean egocentric. That's not what a narcissist is. If you hear a pastor say that, they are one, run and or uh, ask them to clarify because they may not know that narcissism is a disorder. That means they have to prey on other people to get a sense of identity because theirs was broken in childhood and there is no known cure for it. They are incapable of a true apology because they lie to themselves and their entire personality was fake to begin with. They lose track of the truth and lie to themselves to protect themselves from shame. Um, the American church puts them in the, in the pulpit because they are usually pretty polished and winning over people is like their whole thing. The church has evolved in its understanding and acceptance of various issues, including dishonesty, premarital relations, and women speaking in congregations. Um, the topic of homosexuality, however, remains a contentious issue, deeply entangled in political and social debate. So, interestingly, Mike has stated, we love gay people here at IHOP. We just want them to repent, but we don't lead with that message, which considering his political stance appeared relatively progressive. Susan also raised concerns about behaviors and traits that might suggest deeper psychological issues, specifically pointing towards narcissism within spiritual leadership. This discussion is not just about allegations or personal opinions, but about understanding the complex nature of narcissism as it pertains to leadership roles, particularly within the church. Narcissism, as defined by psychological standards, specifically the DSM, goes beyond mere egocentrism. True narcissistic behavior involves a deep-seated need to feed on the attention and admiration of others, often resulting from a fragmented sense of self-rooted in early developmental stages. This need can manifest in the creation of a fabricated persona, living a double life, manipulating others, and emotionally exploiting individuals. Narcissists often prey on perceived beauty and weakness, valuing others based on these superficial assessments, ultimately leading to the erosion of the victim's identity. Susan's insights bring to light an important point, the allure of of narcissistic individuals in leadership positions, especially within spiritual contexts. Their charm, polished demeanor, and ability to win over people can obscure the underlying dysfunctional behaviors and tendencies. Side note, the issue is compounded by a general misunderstanding of narcissism. There's a difference between someone admitting to narcissistic tendencies in an effort to be transparent and the acknowledgement of a disorder that affects how they relate to others. A true narcissist is incapable of genuine apology or self-reflection because their entire identity is constructed around avoiding shame and maintaining their fabricated self-image. Okay, back to the letter, Susan states. You wrote referring to my sister. 
This was 43 years ago, and the lady is now a 57-year-old grandmother and minister. She's not 14 anymore, and Mike Bickle was only 25 when she was. You are speaking about sexually touching a child. This is hebophila. People are in jail for these actions. You took a 14-year-old little girl, one that was pure, naive, had never had a boyfriend, had never had a kiss, and you touched her sexually, manipulated her emotions, deceived her spiritually, and spent the next 43 years ensuring her silence. You told that 14-year-old little girl to own the abuse because you had a wife and children. You groomed her and our family so that you would have access to her. You betrayed her and our parents. The only person in the world that would downplay Habophila is you. Again, I welcome professional psychologists, psychiatrists, prosecutors, and attorneys to enter this argument and make their case. And Mike, as you sink into your safety net of the statute of limitations, let me educate you on the fact that there are child sexual and clergy abuse cases where, due to repression and memory loss, the statute of limitations doesn't start until the victim's memories are no longer repressed. Numerous people from 1980 to January 2024 can attest to Tammy's repression and memory loss through the years. More and more witnesses are lining up, Eeyore, including those that can attest to actually seeing you touch Tammy when she was 14 years old. One of them is me. I saw you. You wrote, we find that Dr. Brown is misspeaking here. This position is found nowhere in the Bible. More on our opinion later. How many times in your sermons have you said, more on that later? In your slurring renditions of pseudo-preaching, you utter these words consistently. We'll get to that in a minute. More on that later. I'll explain that in a minute. You don't know what I'm talking about. There'll be more on that later. All phrases pulled directly from your sermons. You are a master of vague verbiage on purpose to mask your lies. You then spoke as if you were God and wrote, God says this, Michael Brown is my friend, but he does not see what I am doing in the spirit regarding Mike Bickle and IHOP KC. Michael, this is not your assignment. Don't speak into this until you seek me for revelation on high. You latch on to particular phrases that give you away. You told Tammy several times that Chris Reed told you that Jesus said to him, my friend MB is in trouble and I want you to help him. You think that by repeating a phrase that one person said they had in a word from God, it validates your false word. It doesn't. Listen to them and do not get in my way. Your heart is yet hard, son, and you do not know how to restore my fallen heroes yet. You can learn, but you will need to be softened in my presence. Reality check. You are not a hero. People who commit pedophilia are not heroes. People who sexually abuse others are not heroes. False prophets are not heroes. At the present, you are presuming to speak for my heartbroken bride and that makes you dangerous. Reality check. What is dangerous is allowing you to speak to, about, and for God's people. Seek my face until you get a revelation of what I want. The real prophets do not need you to speak. We will speak for you if you will listen. My prophets built Ihop Kasi, and only they can rebuild her. Mike, if God is speaking this, then who is the we? If God is speaking, it would read, the real prophets do not need you to speak, they will speak. Or if God is speaking, it would read, the real prophets do not need you to speak, I will speak for you. When you wrote we, it was because you are speaking as Mike Bickle, not God. You pretend to be a prophet of God. Thus, when you speak about the prophets of God, you associate yourself with that group. That's why you accidentally wrote we. Reality check. Your psychosis is showing through. My son, I will restore whoever I want and your opinion does not matter. Mike Bickle is the best I have for the assignment I have called him to and I don't want you getting in the way of what I am going to do through him. The Antichrist is coming and you are throwing off my plan to lead people to safety. Mike Bickle is my chosen vessel and you will see this. Are we to believe that God is actually whining about someone throwing off his plan? Are we to believe that any human has the power to throw off God's plan? Reality check. God did not choose you, Mike Bickle. You are not a chosen vessel. You are a coward. You cannot even embrace the truth of who you really are. You harbor so much self-hatred and self-animosity that it is easier for you to abuse others than it is to love yourself. I need a Bob Jones right not, not a show host. I will find a Bob Jones and he will sort this out. This is too big for just anyone. I need a seer like Bob Jones. The show host, I think, is a reference to Bowles. Um, 
It's interesting that Bonnie Jones, the late Bob's wife, first had the Lot's wife type thing. Sound delusional. This is not God speaking. God doesn't need anyone. God doesn't need a human to sort anything out. This entire pretend word from God is the rantings of a psychotic individual slipping further into a delusional state. God doesn't talk too much, but you do. You always have. You talk too long and too much. In fact, as a little girl, I remember my dad teasing you about your sermons being too long. He used to call you a space cadet because you always rabbit trailed off topic. At 10 years old, my parents actually dressed me up as a space cadet to go to a church party. I had my dad's gold glittery motorcycle helmet on with antennas taped to it and a sign around my neck that read, Mike Bickle, Space Cadet. It makes me sick to think about now. You might have actually gotten away with the pedophilia or hebophila, the sexual abuse and the false prophecy if you hadn't loved the sound of your own voice quite so much. You have been ensnared by your own words. And that is an irony I find amusing. You wrote, the Bible used David after he murdered a man in cold blood, married his wife, and had children with her. Oh, your obsession with David, how it has haunted you through the years. With every child and woman you abused, you have shared what you believe is a likeness to David. Another telltale clue of Mike Bickle posing as Larry Wiseman. Let me state it clearly, Mike Bickle, you are not David. You are not like King David. You are not a man after God's own heart. You are a man after personal glory. Side note, is Solomon more appropriate? Susan goes on to quote Mike saying, you wrote, God says that Dr. Brown is way off on this one and that Mike Bickle will once again rise up and walk out his amazing calling. Now, if this sin was committed, of course it is not a good thing. It is morally wrong for a 25-year-old young man to engage in non-intercourse sexual behavior with a 24-year-old girl. Reality check. God must have been having an off day when he gave you this word because Tammy wasn't 24 years old. When you sexually abused her, she was 14 years old. Thus, I am certain that God would not simply say your actions against her were merely morally wrong. To be clear, your sexual actions against my sister at the age of 14 were, are legally wrong. You belong in prison, and I have every intent of seeing you serve time for your crimes against these women and children. You then wrote, however, we believe that Jesus squashed that sin and washed Mike White in his blood 40 plus years ago. Furthermore, here is what this 57-year-old minister and grandmother told the Kansas City Star. After sexual contact, Wood said, Bickle was always remorseful. I have witnessed him genuinely weep and repent, like ask the Lord's forgiveness, ask my forgiveness, she said. I saw at 14 a man in anguish over failure, and he would always be like, I can't, we can't do this again, and please forgive me. We believe that Mike Bickle was forgiven way back then. Reality check. Once again, does God have multiple personalities? Why is he referring to himself as we? In addition, an abuse victim cannot extend forgiveness for that abuse at the time of the abuse. A 14-year-old child is incapable of forgiving a man in a power position over her, who has proclaimed that his wife is going to die and he's going to marry her. Have you heard of Stockholm Syndrome? Do you understand what grooming is? You physically, emotionally, and mentally ravaged her, and then you spiritually tied it all to God and manipulated her into silence. Again, I invite psychiatrists and psychologists to analyze the situation and give their professional opinions. When you write about my sister, you reference her each time as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother. You repeat these words because you want the world to see her as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother, and not as the little girl you fondled in your car touched in your office and ravaged in the safety of our home in the blue bathroom. What you did to her at 14 years old, demanding her to own it, telling her your wife would die and she would be Lukey's mom, defiling her sexually, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, has shaped her life, her kids' lives, her husband's life, and her family's lives. It is only by God's grace that we have emerged from this. The world will see her as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother, but they will also see her as the child you defiled that became the woman with the courage to break free and the strength to speak up. She is a hero. You focus on non-intercourse, a meaningless distinction when discussing pedophilia. Non-intercourse only signifies you did not these children and women. It does not lessen the abuse. You wrote, 
If Dr. Brown really thinks Mike Bickle would be unfit for ministry, he must also think that all of Mike's ministry to the body of Christ was a fluke or accident. Scary. So scary. I want to speak slowly and intently here. If anything good came from the Mike Bickles ministries, including the all-encompassing IHOP KC, it is because God is merciful, sees the hearts of those truly seeking Him, and grows beauty in their lives. God is true to His word, even in the midst of someone being blasphemous, destructive, and evil in His name. Be clear, you, Mike Bickle, have created nothing good. You wrote, Anyone who thinks Mike Bickle should have never been in ministry is unaware of how God anoints and appoints people. Whoever thinks this might as well accuse Bob Jones and all the other amazing prophets who built Yehop KC with Mike Bickle. Yes, you, Mike Bickle, and all of your KC prophets are false prophets, spreading false doctrine, made-up miracles, and outright lies. You are deceivers. You wrote, The Lord will place you next to Harry Truman's property as a sign and wonder. The Bible warns against signs and wonders. One would think a pastor of your ranking would know this. You wrote, they're trying to destroy 50 years of ministry, my legacy. Tammy read this and said, this is what Mike Bickle told me multiple times this past fall. He was only concerned with his legacy. Once again, your own words come back to bite you in your fraudulent ass. Mike Bickle, your legacy is that you will be known as a false prophet. You will be remembered as a weak, cowardly man who never embraced the truth about himself and instead used the name of God to distort truth and mislead thousands. Your legacy is that you are a pedophile or is it hebophile and a sexual offender. You are everything that is anti-Christ. You are an abuser. You are a snake. Who are the 12 judges you write about? Is it your attempt at rebranding already with your 12judges.com listed on the Tyus Larry Wiseman X account and your 12judges.com already up and running, loaded with false prophecy? I do not advise going to that website. And again, we've seen the things Mike put together usually be a bit more coherent than that website. So it's possible with a narcissistic collapse that he is struggling badly, lost a step and aging, or it's just one of his advocates. Jess here to 11 Jessies. Reality check. You are delusional, buying into your own psychosis for too long. Your charisma has been suffocated by your lies. You posted a naysayers list, but you left off the names of more than 4,000 people who have signed a petition for a third party investigation into you. These are not naysayers. They are truth seekers demanding justice. I saw through you as a little girl of 10 years old. I saw through you as an adult woman when I wrote House of Lies and fought for my sister. I see through you now and so do thousands of others. My advice based solely on my own opinion come out of the closet already. Let your beard of a wife go so that she can find real love. Confess to the pedophilia and sexual abuse and don that orange jumpsuit. Just think how many boyfriends you'll have in prison. Talk about glory days. You were right about one thing. God has been building an army in Grandview, Missouri, and it's an army to take down false prophets. God has a word for you, Mike Bickle. He says, thanks for your help building the army that will take you down. Not really, I don't speak for God, but if I were God, that's what I'd say, followed by a mic drop. Susan Claridge, Tammy Woods' sister. His letter not only sheds light on new allegations, but also critically examines the prolonged silence of Mike Bickle, a silence he attributed to divine guidance. Amidst these serious accusations, rumors of a fabricated online identity emerge, suggesting an effort to mask true intentions, raising important questions about the integrity and accountability of spiritual leaders. Susan Claridge's poignant address to Mike Bickle is both a confrontation and a call for accountability. She accuses Bickle of embodying traits starkly opposed to Christ-like virtues, such as narcissism and deceit, and warns of the dangers posed by false prophecy and manipulation um, yeah, within spiritual leadership. Her letter serves as a stark reminder of the responsibility leaders bear in maintaining the trust and faith of their followers. She suggests that his public expressions of regret may in fact conceal deeper unacknowledged desires this revelation prompts a broader discussion uh, on the complexities of uh, identity, the courage required um, to confront one's truth, and the implications of such truths on spiritual leadership and community trust. The letter goes further to criticize Bickle's communication style, highlighting a pattern of vague and evasive language that Claridge interprets as an attempt to obfuscate truth. 
This critique underscores the importance of clarity, sincerity, and honesty in the communication of spiritual leaders with their congregations. In a bold move, Claridge invites professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, legal experts, and theologians to engage in a comprehensive analysis of Bickle's behavior and public statements. This call to action emphasizes the need for a multidisciplinary approach to understanding and addressing the complex issues at hand. As we reflect on Susan Claridge's open letter, it becomes clear that the central issues extend beyond individual allegations to encompass broader themes of truth, transparency, and integrity in spiritual leadership. This situation serves as a reminder of the critical importance of holding leaders accountable for their actions and ensuring that they embody the values uh, they preach. This unfolding story is a call to all members of faith communities to engage in open, honest dialogue about the qualities we seek in our spiritual leaders and the standards to which we hold them accountable. Let us commit to fostering environments where truth is cherished, transparency is upheld, and integrity forms the foundation of our spiritual journey. I'm still processing it all. So yes, that is the open letter, the revelations by Susan Claridge, Tammy Woods' sister, also known as the second Jane Doe. There's some speculation that Misty was the third, and I mention this because grooming a 19-year-old isn't just sick and twisted, it's heartbreaking. We've always heard about IHOPU instructors discussing their preference for the wet cement of teenagers, as the older ones were too entrenched in their home church's teachings. But what detrimental messages were imprinted on this wet cement of these young adults who were on staff and targeted? I'm re-watching old mic clips, and this is difficult. There's one where he attempts to endear himself on stage to another female speaker's parents, trying to present himself as a Holy Spirit mush bucket, just like her dad. It was incredibly cringeworthy at the time, but I think many of us now recall numerous moments like that, where he was all smiles and manipulation, and we found ourselves making excuses because the teaching seemed so insightful. We'd think, oh, that's just Mike being a little weird, or, or the classic, I must not have all the information here. Like when Brian, Kim, and Grace announced their engagement, long before they were married. Grace had been closely connected to some that people wildly speculate about Mike's interest in, but Grace was one of the most beautiful and blonde, so now I wonder if Mike had a crush on her. This should have been a beautiful moment of celebration, and yet, Mike managed to overshadow it. During the church announcement in front of the congregation, he turned to Brian and asked, how did she end up with you? There was an audible groan, and Brian just looked broken, and they moved past it. Or the staff meeting where he expressed sadness that Katie B. was not attending, saying, Ah, uh, I wish she was here. I just love Katie. But it's unlikely he would say that about a male staff member, you know. Again, it was cringeworthy and a glaring red flag in plain sight. Yet we just thought, well, Katie is kind of awesome. I get it, haha. Huh? But now listening to old staff meetings and things, and it's just like the way of talking to young women. I know nearly every man over 50 still goes by the ancient ways, and Trump endorsed that behavior and emboldened it. But I guess like when you send your kid off to Bible school, you just don't expect it. A little housekeeping. We are still receiving a lot of comments and emails about the Misty article with a lot of voices on both sides of this issue. It's just wild how the Twitter mob wants to label Mike as a narcissist and IHOP as a cult, but doesn't understand that Misty is emerging from a powerful cult and lifelong grooming. That resulted in a multi-million dollar loss and cliff drop into blackmail and trauma that we don't have the capability of having the empathy required to understand. All of these people are led by Joel and the AG who focus all on the Bible with no awareness of mental health. They are offending and still hurting victims by holding the victims responsible for fixing a system that broke them. Um, and they are years away from being healed enough to fix anything. They are way too close and need to be fully deprogrammed. That is what we are doing with our little free time is putting together a deprogramming series that aims to help restore victims to ministry in a healthy church. This was a singing cult, which is a level 10, because when you sing something tied to obeying leadership, cult leadership, it controls you and creates a cult given identity far deeper than a regular one. Not to mention the fasting. Thanks again for the sub and the like. It means so much. And lastly, a side note, 
this discussion on narcissism is not meant to cast judgment or spread unfounded allegations, but to encourage a culture of awareness, understanding, and discernment within our communities. It's a call to recognize the signs of unhealthy behaviors and to question the structures that allow such individuals to rise to positions of influence without scrutiny. As members of faith communities, we must be vigilant and discerning, fostering an environment where leadership is held accountable and where the well-being of the community is prioritized over charismatic appeal. This includes being educated about psychological disorders and their impact on interpersonal relationships, especially within contexts of spiritual guidance and authority. When you write about my sister, you reference her each time as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother. You repeat these words because you want the world to see her as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother, and not as the little girl you fondled in your car, touched in your office, and ravaged in the safety of our home in the blue bathroom. What you did to her at 14 years old, demanding her to own it, telling her your wife would die and she would be Lukey's mom, defiling her sexually, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, has shaped her life, her kids' lives, her husband's life, and her family's lives. It is only by God's grace that we have emerged from this. The world will see her as a 57-year-old minister and grandmother, but they will also see her as the child you defiled, that became the woman with the courage to break free and the strength to speak up. She is a hero. You focus on non-intercourse,